Okay, uh, let's call to order um, <coughs> the regular business meeting for the Board of, Board of Education for Monday, September 25th. If I could ask everybody to please stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Everybody, roll call, please. Jim Batson. Here. Pat Rudy. Here. Kevin Huber. Here. Scott Luce. Here. Karen Lundstedt. Here. Ellen Mauer. Here. Max Thurman. Here. All right, so we have everybody present. On um, our agenda this evening, we will um, open it up for public comment. Uh, remind anybody from the public if they're going to speak to limit your comments to three minutes, please. We have an educational presentation on innovation grants in action. We will have updates from the student school board reps, um, superintendent's report. Um, there are a number of bids in there that we'll discuss. The consent board agenda, which we reviewed earlier in the month. And then program and personnel, facilities and finance. Nothing on property, right, Scott? No. Okay. Any we want to bring? You can, you can just I'll provide just an update. update. I'll We're get right. a quick update. So a quick update? And uh, anything on seal? Yes. Okay. And Jim, anything on that? Just one quick. Okay, good. All right. Um, <coughs> so let's go. Anybody from the public who would like to speak? No. Okay. Um, so we will then go to um, our educational presentation, Innovation Grants and Action. Uh, Brent, are you or Tom going to introduce our guests this evening? Good evening. Here we go. Good evening. Um, it is with great pleasure that I get to introduce to you a Libertyville High School teacher extraordinaire. Um, Ms. Sherry Rooks teaches AP Chemistry this year. and. Um, I learned and kind of met Sherry before we ever met in person because when I started at Libertyville High School in the summer, I kept getting emails about this chemistry teacher that was making all of these presentations at national conferences and winning all of these awards. And it, every time I would look at who it was, it was always Sherry Rooks. So um, I was just uh, always getting filled in about the extraordinary work she was doing and then have gotten to uh, see some of this in person. So we are in for a, a very interactive presentation this evening, highlighting um, some of the work she's doing and the support from our district education uh, foundation. So without further ado, the extraordinary Sherry Rooks. So good evening, everyone. I am here to talk about how my innovation grants transformed the chemistry classroom. So it's gonna be a journey, the very first one that I won was for Chemistry Day. And then later on, I talked to the foundation board and I was able to receive money for my biodiesel project. With the biodiesel project, I had my students research and learn how to make biodiesel with pure vegetable oil. It was a simple organic reaction, very easy for the students to understand, and they were able to then analyze and compare the properties of biodiesel versus normal diesel versus gasoline. However, it didn't stop right there because the waste product of biodiesel was glycerin and then my students learned how to make glycerin soap with the waste product. So 100% of the products was used for something. After that, my students researched and tried to figure out how to make biodiesel with waste vegetable oil and they learned on all the steps that they needed to make sure the standards were kept with the pure vegetable oil with the waste ve vegetable oil. The other project that year was my chemistry day program, and this was when I was teaching honors chemistry. I would have my students at the end of the year look at topics that we taught, and they had to come up with an activity and teach younger kids the chemistry concepts. So on a Saturday morning, I would have my chemistry students all come in, and we would then teach all chemistry to kindergartners, first graders, second graders, with many hands-on activities and they had to explain it in simple terms, not the chemistry terms that they learned. The following year, I was able to receive two grants, one for material science and one for the chemistry of foods. With material science, if you look all around this room, you see a bunch of solids. 
However, in a traditional chemistry classroom, we talk about gas laws, we talk about liquids, we do a lot of aqueous chemistry. We don't really talk about solids. So in this unit, my students were able to look at the chemistry of polymers, which looked at resins and foams, and looked at how adding just additives to the resin could create new properties and new things with that foam. They also learned about heat treating of metals and looked at what would do with the heat treating, whether it be stronger, making it tougher, making it more malleable, etc. They were then able to look with the rolling mill and with the draw plates, be able to see how malleable metals really were. And they really enjoyed seeing how flat they could make that penny. This is not even the longest penny. We also were able to melt and pour tin. They never were able to see molten metal. This is the first time students were able to actually see molten metal in the classroom and actually see metal melt at a true temperature, not at a slow period of time. At a true temperature, it has a melting point. They were making what is known as a tin bar, and then with tin, it has a special property. Eight elements on the periodic table, when you bend it, all the atoms will shear and make an acoustic sound. And Tom is going to try this with my tin bar. He's going to use his mighty muscles. Oh boy, and John's going to move. Did you hear the noise? I heard like a cracking sound. That is what is known as tin cry. So only a few elements actually do that. So my students were able to make their own little tin cry bars, and it was neat because once it was done, they could just remelt it and make a new one. With the chemistry of food, they loved it. They used the George Foreman grills, they used toaster ovens, we looked at the biochemistry of fruits, vegetables, of spices, and then we ended up with the chemistry of baking and candy making. They learned about crystal size and how to make the best fudge possible versus solution chemistry and mixtures with making lollipops, taffy, gum. They actually had to sample everything. So the following year, I got three grants, fishtails, solar cells, and nanotechnology. Fishtails, we were able to collaborate with AP Bio and AP Chemistry. We went to the Shedd Aquarium, and we actually worked with scientists to understand the chemistry and biology of Lake Michigan and to try to learn and help out with ideas on how to fix some of our environmental issues. With solar cells, I was able to buy conductive glass, and they were able to create solar cells <coughs> using uh, blackberries, raspberries, lots of fruits, vegetables, and flowers as anodes, test it out and see how efficient that solar cell was. We then connected solar cells together to make a solar panel. And then they were able to light a light bulb and a miniature fan with it. Nanotechnology, that's a huge topic now, but it's been around since medieval times. If you look at stained glass, anything ruby red, or yellow-green stained glass from medieval times was due to nano-sized particles of gold and silver. You also had born with a silver spoon in your mouth. That's not because they were just rich, but every time you ate with silver, you scrape off nano-sized particles of silver, and you actually were antimicrobial, that silver, so you became healthier and were able to fight off any illnesses. The one that we're going to do today, because I don't like to talk all the time, is the lotus effect because of the lotus leaf. The lotus leaf is a self-cleaning leaf. So all that dirt and grime gets on the lotus leaf. When it rains, the rainwater likes to beat up and be attached to itself, then the leaf. So then the water just rolls off, like you see in that middle picture, picking up all the grime, and it cleans itself. This is the start of your stain-resistant clothing due to nanotechnology. So you have a baggie that has two spoons and a pipette in it. And so the first spoon is the one that you're going to look at is kind of tannish white. That's normal play sand. And with your pipette, 
You're going to just put one drop of water on that spoon, observe, look at how that water is on the play sand. You see that it beads up slightly. Try to twist your spoon to see if you can roll that spot around. Doesn't do much. Not fun. But if you pick the orange spoon, and it's not because I'm from Libertyville, my favorite <laughs> color is orange, just so you guys know. Um, if you put one drop of water on this spoon, you will see how it beads up, and you can try to twist your spoon back and forth. You can move that water around, and that's because this is so hydrophobic that the water wants to attract to itself, not to the sand. And so this is how the stain-resistant clothing is. You can get a spray, put it on mirrors, and it will never fog up, so people who wear glasses would never have problems getting out of the shower or going from cold weather to, to hot weather inside in the winter time. That is how we get our clothing, all this material, they're that way. So one of the activities my students do is that they have to research and cry, try to create a lotus effect spray. Those spoons are for you, so you can have that pipette and spoon activity forever. <laughs> The following year was after chemistry, I got a, an iPad so I could use doceria and everything in the classroom, and extruding bioplastics. It's another entity of material science, but I saw a need for bioplastic because there was a lot of news stories saying compostable plastics or plastics won't degrade. If it is a compostable plastic, that means the plastic has to degrade at the same rate as paper breaks down that you can't see it at all in the environment, and we could keep using that land afterwards, and it's renewable. One thing about bioplastics, it's that it is a thermoplastic. So here is my next little learning lesson for you. I am not gonna melt anything. <laughs> so everyone knows that this is a milk jug. This is a heat gun, not a blow dryer. This is too hot. It will burn if you want a new look. If you think bald looks are in. And they are. <laughs> so I tell everyone, it is just like my students. Your plastic water bottle, your plastic milk jugs need a little time to wake up and move. So I'm going to give my plastic jug energy. And as I give it energy, my plastic starts moving. And one fascinating thing is when the plastic molecules move around and you can't really see, it becomes more translucent, transparent that you can actually see through it. But that's not the fun, exciting part. Why are we recycling milk jugs? So I'm going to add some heat to this guy. And now you have the plastic bag that you get at Target, at Best Buy, everywhere else. And in fact, one of the activities my students have to do is those chocolate milk bottles that are in the cafeteria. They bring them to my classroom. They measure how much water could hold in them. Then we use the heat gun, they blow it out, and then they see how much more water we could actually hold because the amount of plastic we use with these milk jugs is because we jam everything into our refrigerators and we have containers like pizza boxes and everything they could break. Milk will hold in a plastic bag that is as thin as your paper bags or your vegetable bags, but we are just not talented to keep them that way. <laughs> then I got a gas chromatograph to add to my collection of SPEC 20, so now my students are able to add and analyze unknown gas compounds, which is a real nice thing besides just analyzing colorful solutions. Me and the physics department, we were able to get swiveled cameras to help with our flipped classroom one year. <clears throat> then I was able to take a green chemistry class and learn about the 12 principles of green chemistry, try to change and transform some of my traditional chemistry labs into more green, environmentally friendly ones, as well as my students now do research to figure out what products are more environmentally hazardous and need to be working on a greener solution. 
Then my one that I really like to talk about is connecting earth science and chemistry. We do soil testing, we do water testing, but the one that I really like in this unit is my clean water project. Every class in AP Chem picks a third world country. They have to analyze that third world country, see what is around in that environment. In fact, one group who did Africa, research and saw that somewhere in Africa, they actually made the first house made out of plastic empty bottles. And so they knew that third world countries had a lot of plastic, they looked at the soil, what kind of gravel, and their job was to come up with a filtration system that the third world country would be able to use their own supplies to try to clean the water. We couldn't take it out of any of the microbes, but they got the water to be cleaner. And so this is one step working on the global issue of clean water supplies. And lastly, this past November, I was able to get three grants, one for a light board, one for radiation, and one for happy atoms with the rest of the chemistry department. And so here is, while I'm talking, a short example of a light board activity. And what a light board is, and on the PowerPoint it's not as clear as if they saw it on YouTube, you are able to talk and write at the same time. So it's flipping the image and the students are able to watch you do the actual activity as if you were in the classroom on your whiteboard. And so for acid-base equilibrium problems, for redox reactions, this is one way students are going to be able to watch, listen, and see someone go through a problem instead of just hitting click, click, click on the PowerPoint. With the happy atoms, Instead of the normal ball and stick models, we now have ones that have the lone pairs. So students understand covalent bonding more. And the nice thing about these, they are magnetic. We could also do ionic bonds, something that we were never able to do with the ball and stick models. For the radiation in the palm of your hand, these are the Geiger counters that we used to have in the classroom. Okay, the old fashioned one, the digital one, but now Mr. Bush and myself, we're able to have that little tiny thing on the end of the cell phone, which is a Geiger counter, and my, our students using the iPads in, their, in the classroom, using their Chromebook, or using their cell phones, are able to add this adapter to it and test the radiation of different materials. So they go and test the things that we have in the classroom, and then each lab group actually goes and checks out the the radiation detector, and then they go and see what about the cinder blocks, what about their basements if they live in a very old house, what kind of radiation might they be getting. So this is now putting practical application to nuclear chemistry, nuclear physics that we used to just be able to do as a demo or show video clips. So in conclusion, I want to thank the school board, the foundation, everyone for giving me the opportunity to show you how Adding these innovation grants transformed my classroom into more practical applications, connecting chemistry to the real world. So, thank you. Do uh, you have any questions or comments for sure? Yeah, I was just wondering, so all these different things, are they becoming a part of all the science classrooms? Um, the work you've done, is it being passed on and then used from year, I mean, obviously this is over a lot of years. It's over a lot of years. Some of the activities have gone into the other classrooms, more so with uh, honors chem, the water and everything, and uh, earth science went into all levels of chemistry. I would love to, and with PLCs, we are, I talked to more of the earth science teachers to get more of a connection. So slowly, we're getting more and more of an interaction. It sounds like you're spreading the word to other schools. That's too. what I'm really trying to do. Great. Sherry, talk a little bit about, because you're pretty humble at the end of the day, and, and as Tom um, has indicated, you've been recognized by your peers many times through being invited to present, but also receiving some awards. Why don't you talk about Golden Apple for a minute, because that was a pretty cool process. Yeah, it, it was something that I didn't know that I was nominated. I got a letter saying, congratulations, you're nominated for the Golden Apple. The Golden Apple Award, it is a nomination that you never know who nominated you, so I don't know who to thank. And it was a self-reflection on why I wanted to be a teacher, how I taught, what I do for the community, and, 
and the education. And I thought my biggest achievement was becoming a finalist. I was happy with being one of those 30 people that got selected as a finalist. I thought that was the icing on the cake type of thing. They came and observed, and I don't know what my colleagues said, you know, because I did not coach anyone, but they saw my classroom, they saw what I do in my classroom, and it was amazing to win. You know, it was, it was nice to be recognized, and as Prentice said, I am not one to, to really say anything. So I, I did, I really thought it was amazing things, and to hear my students what they really think and can say they, they're the reason why I do it, so. And as, as the, um, <coughs> the newer board members weren't on the board when you won that uh, award, but we were asked to come over um, and be there when the folks from the Golden Apple Foundation actually came to LHS and they invited all of her students and she was teaching a class and it was just an amazing affirmation from her students and the school community that, that she influences every day. So, and that was awesome and we got to be with Sherry down in Chicago at the, the actual dinner and, and the awards event. It was very cool and, and, and much deserved. And Sherry, if you don't mind, I'm gonna do a shameless additional plug for the foundation, okay? The mission of the foundation is to provide resources to enrich and enhance teaching and learning in the district. Sherry is a wonderful example of many examples of the work, uh, the very uh, innovative work that the foundation has funded over the past decade. Um, they have given out over $300,000 of innovation grants to our teachers at both schools at no expense to taxpayers. Again, over and above what the taxpayers provide. Um, and the foundation uh, now has um, an endowment that's uh, about a quarter of a million dollars. So in that 10 year journey, Sherry was one of the early award recipients uh, and uh, was, was great about applying. Um, and a number of our other staff members uh, have joined um, that conga line, if you will, uh, to do some really amazing work. But this is a great example of um, the, the mission of the foundation being carried out through our incredible teachers to enrich and enhance teaching and learning. So wonderful, Sherry, great job, thank you. Well, thank you. Can I give another shameless plug yes. for the foundation? Sure. <laughs> um, you have been a part of it for you know, close to 10 years, a long time. And you have always been a leader in the forefront of putting applications. And we always would challenge can we get other folks up to speed and, and have the same zest, enthusiasm, passion that you have? I mean, it takes a lot of time. We put a lot of scrutiny on those grants. You take a lot of time to, to take those, write those out, um, submit them, put a very good case on why to do it, which is why you get it. Um, you know, we typically, I know innovations grants, we probably fund, I would say, what, twenty to $28,000 every year for innovation grants. Uh, the foundation does. In addition to the innovation grants, each school gets allotment of funds that are left up to the school to use um, for innovation and for um, those initiatives, again, above and beyond what they would normally get through the normal budget process. And the schools both have to come back to the foundation for those separate uh, funds to say how they were used. Um, those funds don't happen by chance. They don't fall out of the sky. They don't fall off the tree. Um, there's a lot of hard work, a lot of volunteerism, a really good board, and um, a lot of people in the community that supports the foundation. So to that end, one of our biggest, I was one of our, it is our biggest fundraiser is coming up this Friday, November 10th at Mickey Finn's. It's a terrific time, terrific cause. We have two alumnus, uh, one from each school that we recognize um, every year. Um, and there's a lot of fundraising, a lot of fun, a lot of camaraderie, um, but Mickey Finn's, if you haven't got it, it's called The Big Event. It's in every e-pause that we put out. It's up on the foundation site, it's on the district site, I think it's on the school sites. It's everywhere, um, but it's a terrific time. The community comes together and you exemplify what those funds are for and the students that participate in it obviously just doesn't carry on for that year. It has legs well beyond it. So thank you, and please come out and support uh, our big event on November 10th at Mickey Fence. 
So we'll move on to the student school board representative. Vernon Hills had their annual back to school kickoff dance with a record breaking number of students attend, just over 630. There was a senior lip sync where four groups competed, and the winning group will perform this Friday at our fall recognition assembly. We had six national merit semifinalists and 16 students commended. There will be a breakfast on November 13th to celebrate these individuals. Dr. G kicked off the class of 2018 in their, in their senior year with the senior parking lot party. He made lunch for the students and music. And for sports news, girls cross country won the Lake County invite for their second year in a row. Boys golf won the Warren International Invitational Merit Club shooting a 304. A senior, Brian Fabia, shot two under par 70 to win medalist honors. Conference is this week for the boys and the girls. Um, volleyball played their Volley for a Cure game, and in conjunction with the St. Viator Volleyball Program, they raised over $2,800. Homecoming is October 7th, and our theme this year is Carnival theme. So Student Council has planned a Carnival Day where there will be games, cotton candy, and popcorn during lunch period. <coughs> this past week was also Yellow Ribbon Week, which was suicide prevention, so it brought awareness to that. Um, September 15th, we had a summer reading book discussion, and um, Mrs. Nieves took a post book chat survey for the students to see what they thought about it, because it's a new direction our, lit our literature department is taking. So overall, we got, po we got a lot of positive feedback from the students, and most of they said they appreciated um, actually discussing the book in depth with other peers, and getting other perspectives on the issue because it was um, all grades discussing the book versus just their own and versus just writing an essay in solitude. They really appreciated getting into a discussion with the books. And one of the authors of our books is coming to our school on October 7th where our um, library staff has prepared a program where you can give a used book and in return you can get one of the author's books called All American Boys um, signed by him. Our orchestra concert, um, our first one of the year, was on September 19th. And the freshman sophomore musical is coming up in October called Curtains. Um, tomorrow is the career fair, and where over 50 companies and over 110 participants come. And um, students get to visit booths and discuss career and educational paths during lunches. Um, so that's something exciting that's happening tomorrow. All right, um, in LHS news, um, Palms Cheer Football have all celebrated their senior night, so all seniors are excited. Um, football, we had our first home game on Friday, and we won against Lake Forest 26 to 10, so that was good. And our spirit for that event was preppy, so everyone was checked out in their preppy clothes. Um, boys so our boys soccer team is ranked number one in the nation, which is like a huge deal. They're really excited about it. And so far they're undefeated, eight to zero. Um, this, Tuesday, this Tuesday they're playing against them on the line. And then also in boys soccer, Ryan Wittenbrink, he was invited to play an All-American game in Orlando on December 2nd, so that was a pretty big deal. Um, in homecoming news, this past weekend, we painted windows downtown, and the theme of the windows is basically like 100 years and decades, and they look really good, so we'll see how the prizes turn out for that. And then this past Wednesday, the girls and guys were nominated for Sweet 16, our honor course. Um, we also celebrated Yellow Ribbon Week a few weeks back, and the, again, the purpose is to celebrate, or not celebrate, to like bring awareness to suicide and mental illness and like remove the negative stigma. So during the crew periods, um, they held Yellow Ribbon Week activities in order to educate freshmen about mental health. And then also there are various activities outside like the cafeteria. And then on our announcements, we talked about mental health as well. Um, on September 16th, which was a Saturday, there was Maddie Palooza. Maddie Palooza, which was hosted in honor of the death of our student Maddie McInerney, who passed away last year. Um, various bands performed at the event, including Pasley, Paisley and Fun Monkey. And there were local businesses such as Cluckers, Dunkin' Donuts, CrossFit Freedom that donated food or like 
the event was at CrossFit Freedom and auction prizes towards the event, and the proceeds for it went to a scholarship that will like be awarded somebody who exemplified <coughs> Maddie's traits because she was just like a very positive person through everything. Okay, so for Drops of Ink, um, Drops of Ink magazine at LHS was nominated for the Pacemaker Award, which is given out annually to the best student mag publications in the country. Um, so that's a huge honor, and I'm part of Drops of Ink, so I'm really excited about that. Um, Drops of Ink was one of the 49 newspapers or news magazines around the country to receive this distinction, and 26 will receive the Pacemaker Award itself at the annual fall convention in Dallas in November. And then wellness leaders had their first monthly meeting at the end of August. So two representatives from every third grade class meet once a month <coughs> and are educated on how to implement the ideals of a healthy lifestyle among their peers. And wellness leaders will meet again this Wednesday before school. And so Dr. Colentis actually formed an advisory board. So um, this board is composed of students from all grade levels that meet once a month, bringing necessary issues to the attention of the principal. So within the advisory board, students were broken up into committees in which they will specialize in addressing necessary school issues. There's equity and inclusion, which I'm a part of, <coughs> athletics and clubs, education, innovation, and learning spaces, LHS rules and policies, student experience and wellness, and finally start time and schedule. So that's really cool, and I'm really excited about that board. Um, the Spanish exchange students came from, like for two weeks that they've been here through a program called Share America and they are immersed into the American culture at LHS, and they will be leaving this Thursday. Additionally, the French exchange students uh, will arrive October 13th, and I know that I'm like, really excited for, um, to see my French exchange students. Um, so talent LHS seniors were named National Merit semifinalists about two weeks ago. So of those who take the PSAT, 50,000, so the top 3.3%, are, are, are commended scholars, and then 16,000, so the top 1.1%, are chosen as National Merit Scholar Assignment finalists, so it's a huge honor for those students. Great job, guys. Thank you. <coughs> All right, superintendent's report. Okay, just to uh, continue with the good news, uh, we'll put some names in um, to the earlier announcement uh, regarding National Merit. So congratulations to the LHS and VHHS seniors who were named among the 16,000 semifinalists in the 63rd Annual National Merit Scholarship Program sponsored by the National Merit Scholarship Corporation. These uh, academically talented students have an opportunity to continue in the competition for some 7,500 National Merit Scholarships worth more than $32 million that will be offered next spring from LHS. The semifinalists are Allison Tong, Colin Miller, Aaron Chen, Siraj Randin Ron, uh, Katie Lund, Julia Mullenhauer, Laura Zeng, Emily Roller, Emily Stone, and Albert Sue. A VHHS Emily finalists are Theodore Chen, Nicole Mag Magtani, uh, Felice Felicia E, um, Amal Parandai, and uh, Hayden Lau, and Kevin Yoon. So congratulations again to all these outstanding seniors. And the students already mentioned just this really great recognition that drops of inks. Uh, has received, and we're looking forward uh, to seeing more of that. Uh, congratulations to Mr. Mr. Gluskin and the staff for their work on that. And that concludes the good news tonight. So, okay, next on the superintendent's report tonight is bid recommendations for the LHS Aquatic Center, better known as the pool. Um, and as we move forward, uh, the board will recall that we did two bids um, earlier in the month. Um, and we have a number of uh, bids. Go, back. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's a report. I think we need that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we are required under number two, I'm sorry, administrator and teacher salary benefits report. Uh, we are required uh, under state school code to uh, compile and present this report in a format that the state provides us every year to the board. Uh, the board does not need to vote on this. We simply need to present it uh, to you and have a record that we've done so. Okay? Right, and then uh, Dan, we put this on the website. So it'll be available for the public. Yeah, since this is out there for the public, can you just run, run, <coughs> excuse me, run through the top so there's no confusion on what things are? Sure, Dan, do you wanna do that? Sure, the, uh, the school code requires posting of the compensation for teachers and sellers in the code and defines salary and the information that it wants to include as uh, base salary, vacation days, sick days, bonuses, annuities, retirement enhances, or other benefits. Um, so it's pretty broad, um, broad in terms of the, the definition of things, but 
that's essentially the terms that they're, they're wanting us to include. Okay, so again, just to be very clear, the bonuses, and that's where the... Performance recognition. Yeah, the, the ones, okay. Right. The annuities were zero, so that's an easy one. Re retirement enhancements were... And essentially would most likely be the TRS, the four TRS that's paid for. Okay. And then other benefits would be the medical, things like that. Health care. Dental. So health, dental. Life. Life, if they're if, if they're doing <coughs> that. Great, thank you. Does that help that we get everything? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, just great. again, just so since this goes out on the we just need to make sure everybody knows what each of the that's, columns represent. That's good. That's very good, Kevin. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, now LHS pool project. Um, so again, the board had approved two initial bids for uh, pool work tonight. We're going to do a number of other bids uh, that have uh, been bid out. So um, we will ask for a motion. I think Jim is actually going to do the motion this evening. Yep. Um, and then um, we get a second, and if you want to have any additional discussion, we can do that. So Jim. Okay, everybody <coughs> relax. This is going to be a while. Uh, the first bid list... Um, includes um, first off uh, masonry work to a1 group for one million nine hundred and eighty two thousand steel work I'm to sorry, just to, to clarify that you said you made a motion I just yes yes okay. this is a motion to approve the following firms for these following amounts for this this uh, group of bid uh, packages masonry work a1 group uh, one million nine hundred and eighty two thousand steel work uh, T.A. Bowman gets that one for one million four hundred ninety-five thousand. General Trades Work, Stuthi Construction for nine hundred eight thousand. Roofing Work, G.E. Ritterford uh, Roofing for six hundred ninety-seven thousand seven hundred dollars. Metal Panels Work for uh, goes to Sterling Commercial for two hundred thirty thousand dollars. Glass and Glazing Work for Lake Shore Glass. Uh, $348,646. Ceramic tile work, uh, Libertyville tile, uh, for $236,416. Acoustic tile work for, uh, goes to Just Right at $64,832. Painting work goes to Cosgrove for $210,700. Bleachers work, uh, Carol Seating, uh, gets that uh, bid uh, for $40,600. Fire protection work, Nelson Fire Protection, uh, $75,358. Plumbing work goes to uh, DeFranco Plumbing, uh, $798,449. HVAC work, Martin Peterson and Company for $3,168,000. Exterior paving work to Abbey, for uh, $253,330,000. Landscaping work to Breezy Hill for $170,904. Those total uh, base bid is uh, $10,679,935, and we're also recommending alternate 1B, uh, which consists of two items, uh, exterior paving work uh, to Abbey uh, for $24,100, and uh, additional landscaping work to Breezy Hill for $14,360 for a total of alternate 1B, $38,460. Second. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, there's yeah, probably a question for Bill Ben, maybe. I noticed a lot of the bids, there was a a big delta between the lowest bid and like for example if there were eight bids usually one was significantly lower the other seven were kind of in a different ballpark how do we prevent from somebody low bidding and coming back and you know trying to say oh that this and that and the other how, right. how do we do that so we we do have a post bid um, meeting with all the contractors so it, to make sure that we're comfortable with with uh, what their bid is as well as that they have all the scope included. So we have a, a complete scope of work, um, as well as all the documents associated <coughs> with the drawing. So essentially, there, it's a recorded meeting 
where they're saying, yes, we have all of this um, in, their, in their bid. So um, we go through the schedule and all, all the other components of the project, but um, we only recommend them if we feel comfortable based on that post-bid meeting. Great, thank you. For example, in the concrete, concrete work that had already been previously approved because of the previous meeting, one of the bidders, when they were going through that process, realized there was a mistake, pretty large enough mistake that they withdrew their bid and it was through that process to kind of vet that out. Oh, that's great because I, I also notice sometimes you see the bidder like crossed out and not understand why. So thank you. Okay. Anything else? All right. Roll call, please. Batson. Aye. Rudy. Aye. Huber. Aye. Luce. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Mauer. Aye. Thurman. Aye. All right. We'll carry. Okay. Next on the superintendent's report. Um, so on the next page, if uh, you're looking on paper. Um, and that is uh, bid, rec bid rejection recommendation on pool work bid. Uh, pool work would be the major uh, part of the project. I think I can describe that. Um, as an overview, and Dan, you can jump in here. We had uh, three, see you guys. Have a good evening, thanks for coming. Um, we had three bidders uh, for that project. Um, two of the bidders had not uh, totally gone through uh, pre-qualification. Um, with our pool consultant, uh, Gilbane has worked with both of those companies in the past. They are very reputable com companies, all have no problem getting certified, which really left us with one bid. Um, and as we've said before, we are not generally comfortable with one bid. Uh, we think it would be um, unfair to our, um, really our constituents and our taxpayers uh, to take uh, one bid on this project. So we're going to ask you tonight to reject the bids and then we're going to rebid this, and we suspect, I think, Dan, that probably all three will rebid, or two of the three will rebid on um, the contract, and then we'll, we'll have some compare and contrast um, on that. Did I miss anything, Dan? Okay. So um, we would be asking for a motion to, um, and we need to say it this way, just as it's uh, stated here, uh, to reject the pool work bid. Is this in any way going to impact our timeline? We, uh, with the rebid, we are putting some language in for, you know, there's some things as far as materials that need to be procured and approved, um, but overall, we don't anticipate that it's going to uh, impact the schedule, um, but that will be a stipulation of the rebid for the contractor. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Okay, uh, next on the superintendent's report this evening is a Brainerd Memorial update. Uh, I sent uh, the board uh, pictures last week. The con since then, the concrete work has been done around in the sidewalk, and the grass seed has been planted. Uh, we looked at a final draft of the plaque today. The artist has done some additional lightning, light, lightning of the um, uh, two impressions of the building, so you can see the detail a little bit more. On those, it looks absolutely beautiful. Um, and so we'll be waiting for the plaque to come. And if you have not had a chance to uh, take a look at it the next time you're through town, then cut over and take a look at it because it looks really nice. Uh, I think it's you know a very worthy project. Mark, you may add anything to that? Um, no, you basically covered it all. So we did we did uh, acknowledge um, and accept the final draft from their artist uh, today. So we placed uh, um, placed it in production. So and we're wait, wait for a timeline from the manufacturer. Is it likely that it'll be up before the 100th anniversary or no? Yeah. No, yeah, I think it's not the flag, but okay. So right. Yeah, that, but everything else. Is yeah, everything, everything else, else is there. Nice. Everything else is there. Right. We uh, we still have to purchase some plants for the base of uh, the structure. Um, so um, yeah. we'll work with with that. With the hot weather, I didn't want to That's purchase right. anything at right. this point. So. <coughs> it looks great. Okay. Um, next on the report tonight is FOIA request, and we've had FOIA re four FOIA requests uh, since our last meeting. And uh, the first request was um, seven thirteen seventeen. 
uh, from Ted Perlman and all evidence from LHS that it conducted its parking lot lottery in, in a format that was open to the public, was overseen by an unbiased third party entity, i.e. Deloitte or CBIS. The names of the 300 students at LHS who were given the opportunity to purchase an annual on-site parking spot and the names of the 76 students who were not given that opportunity. Um, as an update to this one, um, the request for review submitted by Mr. Prilliman uh, to the PAC Attorney General's Office, the disposition was on 8-16-17, the PAC conclusion was the request for the review is unfounded, the file is closed. So in other words, that information will not be provided. Uh, the next was on 8-15-17, uh, Gabriella Lucer Laura Sella, um, any and all purchasing records from 5-19-2017 to current, including purchase order numbers, purchase date, uh, line item details, line item quantity, line item price, vendor ID number, name, address, contact, person, and email address. Uh, Dan, Stanley, and Rose took care of this one. Uh, the deadline uh, response was originally 9-14-17. The response date was 9-15-17 because it was a commercial request. District time spent one hour on 8-24-17. Nathan Mihalich um, requested email addresses of all teachers and administrators in District 128. Brian handled that request. Deadline was 8-31-17. The response date was 8-28-17. Approximately 30 minutes of district time spent. Um, 9-6-17, Jake Griffin, um, an assistant managing editor for the Daily Herald. Reports or documents sufficient to show the number of football players participating on each varsity JV sophomore and our freshman football team at each individual high school in the district for the current school year and each of the prior nine years as well. Brian handled that response. Deadline was 9-13. The response date was 9-8-17. And the district spent approximately 15 minutes. And the final one was from Bonnie Calf, uh, administrative assistant at Deerfield High School. Information for all district administrative assistants including position title, hours, work per year, numbers of years employed by the district salary and hourly rate. Dan and Dan Stanley and Rose DeSico handled that. Um, the deadline was uh, 925 and the response date was today. Okay, so that's not listed on the sheet because we just did that. Um, are those two, are today. numbers two and four the kinds of things we have to? Uh... Um, numbers two from the Halick? Yeah. Uh, yes, we did have to provide that information. And uh, four, Pat, you're looking at the last one. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks like both of those can be our personnel. Um, yes, uh, because it's in the public domain. Yeah, so, Dan, well, we can share his personal information. Um, so, but, but salary and any, anything like that is, is fair game. <coughs> so often uh, these uh, requests will come through FOIA requests. For example, the one from Deerfield, they may be compiling, uh, they may be doing negotiations with a teacher's union or so they're compiling information and they're requesting comparative data, basically, you know, outside of, let's say, Northwell, Northwest personnel administrators that Brian's involved with, then, uh, for example. So that's somewhat common. Um, so if there's any question about these, we always run them about run them by council to make sure. The other thing about FOIA is, is we're not required to create new documentation. That's very important to know. So. Uh, if we have existing reports or existing data, but we're not um, required to sit in a back room and create brand new spreadsheets um, as a result of this process. So, um, you know, we're mindful of that as well. Oh, I'm just surprised right. to provide everybody's email address so some marketing person can now fill up their email with uh... Yeah, because it's a, public e it's a public email address. So, obviously, their home email address we could not give out, but yeah. since we're in the public domain, we have to deliver it. In fact, um, they could get it off the website, too. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's why we're going to do it. They work for them. Of course, and that's where the district kind of comes in, right? And some of the questions about FOIA sometimes, you know, come in as the amount of time that would just have to be spent, you know, getting it off a spreadsheet and sending it uh, to someone. Um, okay, uh, next is uh, we want to acknowledge a donation, and uh, this is Ms. Becky Keene, uh, who lives in Vernon Hills. We want to acknowledge receipt of her very, very generous donation of a Baldwin Grand Piano Model L, uh, 6 feet 3 inches, to the Fine and Performing Arts Department at Libertyville High School in August of 2017. If you know anything about pianos, Baldwin are really, 
nice pianos. So that is a, you know, a wonderful contribution. And lastly, for me under other tonight, I just want to report uh, to the board uh, this evening, again, you're not required to take any action on this, that um, the uh, staff and uh, teachers and support staff and administrators in the district have met the performance recognition um, incentive uh, standards for uh, this year um, in AP testing. Um, the um, um, number of students tested, uh, we met uh, that criteria. Um, and um, also the percentage of three, fours, and fives in ACT composite, uh, we also met that standard. And in an extracurricular participation, uh, we met uh, those contract goals as well. So um, on December 1, um, as uh, in past years, uh, just because of past practice, um, the um, administrators, teachers, and staff who are not on re who are not receiving any pre-retirement um, incentives um, will uh, receive a 1.5% bonus on their base. It does not compound their salary for future years. That is a one-off um, every single year. In addition, any teachers that started here this year are not eligible for the bonus. You have to be here to actually do the work. Uh, and any teachers that retired last year do not get the bonus because they're no longer in service of the district. Okay. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. What's the participation rate in the extracurricular? I'm always curious. Uh, it's 94.2% um, from 16-17. So that would be... That's amazing. Uh, the standard was 90.2%. So uh, that would be any participation in athletics, any student activities, clubs, fine arts, fine and performing arts. Um, and uh, obviously we have a number of students that are involved in multiples um, there are moving forward. So I think, not courses, but. Student in, in term, yeah, in terms of uh, participation, right. Um, which is uh, fabulous, and we think obviously that the, the research and data on student participation in schools and students achieving higher rates is off the chart. So, uh, again, another factor of um, our student engagement in school and their academic performance. So, you know, pretty exciting. It's an amazing number. Yeah, it's a pretty amazing number. Okay. Any, yeah. any, go ahead. Yeah, uh, sure. Just to make sure everyone gets recognized, I think you skipped the uh, Yamaha Foods donation. Okay, let me go back. I did, Mac, thank you. Because we do appreciate the flute just as much as the piano. So. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So, uh, we also want to thank Mr. and Mrs. Eric Ormson, uh, and we want to acknowledge receipt of their generous donation of a Yamaha flute model 225S Center of Fine and Performing Arts Department at Vernon Hills High School. My daughter, who is in college now, is a flute player, and she would much appreciate that donation to the department. So thank you for the for bailing me out there, Matt. Okay, um, and I think unless there are any other questions for me, uh, that's a superintendent's report for this evening. <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, the consent vote agenda is listed. Uh, was reviewed earlier this month in the committee. If I could ask for a vote to approve the consent vote agenda. I move to approve the consent vote agenda. Second. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Huber. Aye. Luce. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Maurer. Aye. Thurman. Aye. Batson. Aye. 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 All right, motion carries. Program personnel, chair personnel. Okay, uh, we have some board policies up for first reading. So first we have policy 2260 uniform grievance procedure. The changes there, it's just updating language in the body of the text from procedure to policy. We have policy 6180, extend to instructional programs. That updates the language to reflect programs that are currently offered or could be offered in the districts in accordance with state law. Then we have policy 680, uh, release time for religious instruction slash observance. And that updates language to include both include both religious holidays and religious instruction as an excused absence with prior written excuse. And we have policy 7, 325, student fundraising activities. That adds language to the policy that gives more specifics for the fundraising activities. This policy update will enable both schools to further develop procedures to go along with the policy for fundraising. Um, then we have policy 8, colon 70, accommodating individuals with disabilities. And this just adds language to include websites 
as websites need to be readily accessible to and usable by um, individuals with disabilities. Questions on any of those? Okay. So we don't need to vote on those. Um, it'll be up for a second reading next time, and then we can vote on those. Um, next, we have employment of employees, and we're looking for a motion to approve the three replacement hires listed. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Luce? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Maurer? Aye. Thurman? Aye. Baxter? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Hubert? Aye. Okay. And we have nothing for others. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. All right, facilities and finance, Chair versus Batson. Okay, a couple items here. Um, sort of a, a recap on the FY18 capital projects list. It's on the agenda. Well, we just uh, wanted the uh, community to know that uh, we're continuing to work on um, our FY18 capital projects list and updating our long uh, range capital uh, projects list. As um, community may recall, coming out of our budget discussions. Uh, we wanted to make sure that um, we uh, had scheduled and are able to spend uh, the capital needed capital projects um, resources this year on the projects. Uh, I think it's safe to say that we will be able to do that and add some projects if we need to, or take some projects away to um, help as a balancer on the budget. Um, at the end of the day, we're continuing to fine tune that uh, list a little bit. Um, we'll bring that back to committee uh, in October uh, and review that in more detail and uh, get that locked in, uh, ready to go. Okay, and the next item is the uh, 2017 tax levy. Um, over the next month or so, uh, we'll schedule um, a separate meeting with the board to begin to focus in on uh, the 2017 uh, tax levy. Uh, our past practice has been we've had one, at least one dedicated meeting. Uh, to the tax levy to give us uh, plenty of time just to focus on that issue. It is the foundation of um, uh, the resources in the district and it has uh, obviously an impact on uh, everyone in the district. So uh, that will be forthcoming. And Dan, uh, although we're uh, normally done here way before uh, the deadline, um, when is the final deadline for the levy? Has to be approved by the last filed with the county clerk by the last Tuesday in December. Okay, so we'll we'll be again we're way in front of that schedule. Okay, and then next is the uh, approval of a copier lease. This is for the uh, district office. <clears throat> we have a motion, please. So I'll move to approve. Second. Okay. Any questions, comments? Yeah, Dan. Just. The new copier is fine. The old copier, we thought it was going to go to the admin building, but aren't we going to destroy the admin building? So what are we going to do with that thing? Uh, it's going there temporarily for Gilbane to use. Otherwise, Gilbane would go out and get their own and we'd have to pay theirs. It's going to be cheaper to just give them a machine that we already have and don't have to make payments on. Okay. So they'll actually lower our cost for Gilbane. Yeah, I, I was just confused because, I, again, I thought the building was going to go. It is. Not just yet, but it will be okay. soon. And will they then re relocate that to whatever their temporary office space? Correct. Yeah, okay. All right, any other questions? We'll call the same as roll call, please. Lundstedt? Aye. Maurer? Aye. Thurman? Aye. Batson? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Sir. Cooper? Aye. Moose? Aye. Okay, that's uh, anything under other? Okay, that concludes the facilities and finance committee's report. Okay, property committee. Sure. So just a quick update. Um, we were approached um, by a member of the community to see if the school district might be interested in purchasing a house off of Diamond, um, which was really across, across from the field that we have on Diamond and 176. It's right past those business buildings. Um, there's been preliminary discussions. Rick Middleton is a uh, representing us and we are going to go ahead and do some due diligence as it relates to the potential use of that and it might play into potential strategy for long-term parking um, with also what we want to do with eventually do with the property that we've purchased across the street so the team's going to go ahead talk to the village find out what it would take if we wanted to use that and proceed during that due diligence to see if that might be an option 
for a longer term parking strategy in addition to what we talked about in the committee as it relates to looking to see if there also can be something done to the current parking proposal that we have for the pool site. So, so yeah, that would be uh, the potential for spots there if, if it can be zoned. Um, we purchase a property and it can be zoned working with the village. Um, it's surrounded by commercial buildings on two sides and the bike path on the other side. Okay, so it's kind of a unique uh, piece of property. Uh, we think just kind of quick estimation depending on, you know, setbacks and those types of things that we might be able to get up to 50 parking spots in that uh, space. And um, it's, um, it's got some potential uh, for us to certainly take a look at. So we're gonna ask Rick to keep uh, doing his work with uh, um, the owner's family uh, to see uh, what we might be able to do there. And of course, we would bring that back to the board. We'd have to talk about that and uh, if we got to that point, you'd, you'd have to vote you know, on the purchase price. So, Rick, do you have anything else you want to add to that right now? No, I think, I think that um, uh, Mark is going to try and communicate with the village. Right. And, and, you know, unless we were to get a go-ahead, you know, that, or at least a positive response that it could be zoned for that, then, you know, we're not going to make any overtures beyond just touching base with Has to be done. I mean, it has to be due diligence come to okay. fruition, but it might be a nice option. So let it run its course. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Cedal. Cedal. Okay. So just to kind of some updates on some things going on there. There's a lot of things in flux uh, over at that campus. Um, they are happy with the fact that we're. Um, working with their new approach and drive, it reminds me of our situation at Libertyville, uh, has really reduced traffic and backups on Gages Lake. They've, they've increased the bus lane and they can make drop off and kinds of things. And they, so they're doing a lot of construction and, and um, road work as our lead. Yeah, and uh, it, I don't know if any of you guys have spent time there, but I, even though I've gone there all these times, I, I still have get lost. And the roads have just sort of convoluted part of it. Yeah, so they're, they're in the midst of working on that project, but the part that has been on Gages Lake Road has alleviated some of their problems. And they are also, I think I mentioned this once before, but they are in the process of uh, converting a pool to um, community space to use for their classrooms. So I thought that was sort of interesting too. It'd be kind of interesting to see how that process went for them since that's something we'll be doing as well. Um, we are in the first year or that we've had one year of the new tuition formula. And so there it seems as though, and you would better be able to answer this, but they're still kind of weighing how that's all playing out in terms of, and all the state different funding as well. It's, it's, it's a little bit hard to right. kind of keep track of what, what's what and where and they're getting the funding. So we just have to definitely keep an eye on that and trust that, you know, I know you guys are way on top of that much more than I am. Um, they have been negotiating teacher contracts, or will be. They've got the teachers uh, have a contract through this the end of 2018. The paraprofessionals through 2019. So again, they're doing and as are most districts. Their superintendent is retiring at the end of this year. So they are well into their way uh, into their superintendent search. They're working with School Exact Connect, and have had some focus groups already started this month. We'll be hoping to get candidates applying next month in October, bringing five to six candidates to the executive board, narrowing it down, hoping eventually to bring to the governing board um, a final candidate by January 25th. So, pardon? Yeah, that's a tough hire. It is a tough hire. So that's obviously another, you know, bringing uncertainty to that uh, whole call up. Um, there's also, there's also really seen a, a change in, you know, more and more students are going back to the district buildings, but the students that are, there is becoming a, a greater need and more students coming to them in what they call um, shaping appropriate behaviors, I think is for the younger kids, and uh, teaching appropriate behaviors for the older kids. Kids with some pretty severe uh, mental health and emotional health needs and need a really high percentage of adult to student show and they need more space so although their enrollment isn't increasing uh, as schools are going back kids are going back to their home schools um, 
they are looking for more space, they're running out of space, so even though they've built some new buildings recently or been redone, they're trying to get ahead of that and are looking at different uh, facility um, options. Because the nature of the needs of the kids. Because of the nature serving. of the needs of the right. kids. Right. So um, just kind of being aware and watching for that, that will be, and, and also of course they're med very medically fragile students that can't be accommodated in their uh, home school. Um, and then of course the budget. We passed or voted to pass the 17-18 budget, which is pretty flat from the 16-17 budget, uh, like 100, uh, 68 million, 671, 692, up uh, a couple hundred, not even a couple hundred thousand dollars. But um, so they're projecting a pretty large deficit from that. Uh, although this year the deficit they projected was much smaller, more than half a million dollars. So um, again, they're getting their IDEA funds are not. In our right. first meeting in June, they've only gotten one, now they've gotten two, I believe, from last year. And I would expect we would be able to speak better to all of this than, than I am, but um, as I'm trying to, you know, they're trying to really keep their fund, they're trying to keep their expenses down, their revenue sources are pretty uncertain, and that's not a new story. So it was passed. Yeah, just a quick reminder, I don't know if it's still time to get in, but the uh, Lakes Division meeting is coming up <laughs> October 11th, uh, and it's often a, uh, it's always a, a great time to network with other board members from the area, other administrators, and uh, hear a, uh, a good speech. So, so yeah, and that's going to be over the Double Tree and Mundo Line, so it's in the neighborhood. It's so nearby. if you'd still like to go, let uh, Denise to know, just send Denise a note, or Carol. Uh, but you can send an east note, and uh, I'm sure we can probably squeeze you in. Uh, it's a nice evening. Uh, Jim almost always goes, and at least one or more of us at district uh, office will be there, depending on what else we have going on. Come babysit me. In the district, yeah. Is anybody going to the lunch in a week on the Friday? I don't know. I can't. 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 Um, yeah, I can't. Usually, this is pretty good. Okay. Yeah, the ed, the, we had the Fed Ed lunch a couple of weeks ago, and the Ed Red uh, lunch, which is our large suburban lobby group, their kickoff is in a couple of weeks. So again, those are usually very good programs. They bring very good people in. Um, and um, so if you have an opportunity to go, I know it's tough during the day uh, sometimes to do that, but if you have an opportunity to go, I know Pat's gone before Jim, <coughs> several folks have gone over the years. Uh, if you have an opportunity to go, uh, again, just let Denise know and we'll figure out a way to get you in there, okay? Okay. Anything else? Uh, Pat, just uh, one last thing. Just uh, remind the board on um, the 16th of October, uh, we'll be meeting again on uh, pre-negotiations collective bargaining. Um, and then uh, I would ask you to take a look at your calendar um, with you tonight, if you can, to see if you are available. Um, well, this is really the bargaining team, so when Pat announces a bargaining team, then I'll work with them. It would be our first session uh, at the table. So again, on the 16th will be our next meeting together in preparation for uh, sitting down and uh, discussing um, the items with the association and the union. Did that end up working for you? And what was the, um, what was it, the 16th? Yes. Well, does it all make the 16th? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll do anything else that week. Right. Yeah, we're good. Okay, is that it? Is there a motion over here? So moved. Second. All in favor? All right. All right. Thanks. Good night, everybody.